Lord Rees, ladies and gentlemen, friends, it really is delightful to be here on this very special night for us when we celebrate what's about our fifth birthday, uh, but also a huge leap forward for the school. We have bold ambitions, which are to tackle the challenges of the 21st century. And we've just been enormously fortunate to benefit from the vision and generosity of James Martin in making this possible with an initial endowment and now uh, with his new gift, which we've matched, which will more than double the size of the school. What you'll see tonight is a little sample of the sorts of things we are doing. You'll hear from five of us out of the 30 different groups that are currently working in the school. And I hope this gives you a flavor of the breadth and depth, the interdisciplinarity, the scale of the issues we're dealing with, but also their relevance and impact. We don't only aim to advance research through doing it in new ways. We aim to make a difference to the world. What I want to share with you is some of my own work, and some of the perspectives I bring to this, as well as some of the things that we're able to harvest from the school as a whole. What's remarkable, as Lord Rees has indicated, is the breadth and depth and the ability to bring people from many, many perspectives. And being in the Royal Society, which for 350 years has put science at the service of humanity, is a particular privilege. And it's as Lord Rees has said, it's bringing this together in new ways. Now, we're not trying to predict the future. The best minds at the cutting edge of their technologies habitually get the future wrong. And this is true in technology, it's true in politics, and of course it's certainly true in my profession, economics, where over 20,000 PhD economists didn't see the financial crisis coming. So we're not trying to predict the future, but we are trying to embrace it. We're trying to change the way that the world interacts with the future by doing research which is future-facing, both in the reasonably short term of the next decade, but also looking out over the, the whole century. The remarkable thing about this time we live in is the pace of change, the pace of development. There has never been a tidal wave of globalization such as we are experiencing now. And this has been associated in politics with the democracies coming to 60 countries, with the fall of the Berlin Wall, the opening up of China, and many other developments. It's been associated in economics with capital market liberalization, many other developments. And of course, it's a technological leap. And these are, as econom economists would say, endogenous. They feed off each other. These forces accelerate and lead to a more rapid change. So we've had marvelous benefits from this. Our connectivity allows us to be here, allows us to draw knowledge from the whole of the world, allows 300 million school kids that were never educated before to have opportunities for the first time. It's brought immense benefits, and we're trying to understand these and how to spread them more widely, how to ensure that globalization may be more inclusive. And we have a very strong project working on this, to ensure that it becomes more stable, that everyone is able to enjoy this, not just a very few. And we're also trying to understand the systemic risks that globalization spreads. I'm fortunate tonight that we're joined by many of our colleagues from different directors in the school, including though Angela McLean, who is the co-director of our group on pandemics. And what we saw with the swine flu is within a very short period of time spreading to 142 countries. So we know that globalization doesn't only provide the benefit for a rapid evolution of the benefits or the goods of humanity, but also, as we move forward, a much more spreading of the bads. And of course, we've seen this with the financial crisis, which stopped only after it had enveloped the world, after starting in small communities in the south of the US. So how do we ensure that globalization is a more stable force, a progressive force, and doesn't lead to systemic risk? Now, we've been remarkably successful over the past generations in managing the big explosive threat of nuclear war, which hovers over us constantly. The new dimension which the coming years will bring is that individuals for the first time have the power to wreck the planet. Very small groups of individuals are developing an enormous power. And this is not only in areas of biopathogen and other terrorist threats, but it's also, of course, through what individuals can do through industrial mistakes, through reputational mistakes, and in other ways. So how do we understand these choke points, these nodes? How do we ensure that we disperse risk more effectively and are able to harvest the benefits of globalization and manage the challenge? 
The other massive change of recent years is the, is the evolution of a commons that was a community commons into a commons which is global. And as we see in the disappearance of the Aral Sea, and this is a project I was involved in unsuccessfully in a previous uh, job, is the inability of individual groups of actors to collectively do the right thing. Although rationally, they might individually be doing absolutely the right thing. So what we do for ourselves as rational actions, and as nation states even, as rational actions, when we aggregate them at the global level, are disastrous. And as we move forward into the 21st century, this problem of planetary management or managing the global commons will become more and more pressing. And we see it particularly now in climate change, but in other areas. We're trying to draw the lessons of some of the successful management experiences. And this is the Mediterranean Sea, which was restored from being really in dire straits to a place where you can enjoy and swim in safety uh, through the collective action of over 20 countries. What was it that allowed that to be successful but not the Aral Sea experience, and how may we take this forward in the future? We know that we have to provide the sorts of opportunities to the many that few now can afford. So leapfrogging technologies, ensuring not only that technologies are developed, but that they are widely adopted, that they become technologies which assist those that want to, for example, have transport, have that transport, is a key dimension. And we know, too, that the most difficult challenge, and again one that I'm personally involved in, is the reform of the global institutions. Whose hands are on the tiller of the planet? Who's going to help us steer through this extremely complicated set of issues? We know that this set of institutions is fossilized. It's not fit for 21st century purpose. But how do we get from what we've got to something which is going to help us in the future years? That is perhaps the biggest challenge of all. And it's one that requires the coming together of people with very, very different disciplines. That's the sort of purpose that the 21st Century School is for. And I hope as you hear from my colleagues, you'll get the sense from them too. I'm going to start by giving the floor to Sarah Harper, who's the co-director of the Institute of Aging in the 21st Century School. <laughs>